Um, Dr. Charles Krauthammer. Well, he's an inspiration. I say this um, because I kind of wake up with him every morning. People tell me that. Uh, but I, I see his, uh, his repeat, 4 to 5 a.m. And I have to tell you, I'm not one of those people who's really fine-tuned to people who do commentary and pundits. I kind of learn them as they come. And every morning, and I mean this, I, I'd see this guy, and everything he said was right. And I thought, who is this guy? And then I started to pay attention, honestly. And I think that's the way it happens with most Americans. He's a Pulitzer Prize winner, syndicated columnist. You know him from Fox, many other media outlets. But did you know he coined and developed the Reagan Doctrine? Rather ironic, since we're celebrating President Reagan's birthday tonight. Um, he's done so many other things, including uh, graduate Harvard with a medical degree. And that kind of, in talking with him, launched um, his career and where he is now. Without further ado, I give you Dr. Charles Krauthammer. After a beginning like that, I should go home now and quit while I'm ahead. <laughs> Thank you, Richard, for that introduction. You know, there are, there are nice introductions and there are kind introductions. What you just heard was a nice introduction. That's, that's an introduction where people say all the wonderful things you've done. They get it transcribed, they have it notarized, and a copy <laughs> put under your, your mother's doorstep. <laughs> then there's the kind introduction. That's the one where they they leave stuff out. <laughs> See, what Richard didn't tell you is that uh, I once wrote speeches for Vice President Walter Mondale. <laughs> now, as some of you are recovering, I'll, <laughs> I will answer the question that's in your head right now, which is, how do you go from, Fox, from Walter Mondale to Fox News? The answer is simple. I was young once. <laughs> Uh, as you can tell, it was a while ago. <laughs> the other thing Richard very kindly left out was the fact that I'm actually a psychiatrist. I'm still actually legally registered, although I, I mean, I'm retired, although the most accurate description would be to say that I am a psychiatrist in remission. <laughs> Doing very well, thank you. I haven't had a relapse in 25 years. <laughs> I'm sometimes asked to compare what I do in Washington as a political analyst with what I used to do in Boston as a psychiatrist. And as you can imagine, the answer is it really isn't that different. <laughs> in both lines of work, I deal every day with people who suffer from paranoia and delusions of grandeur. <laughs> The only difference is that in Washington, the paranoids and the deluded have access uh, to nuclear weapons, <laughs> which make the stakes a little higher and the work a little more interesting. <laughs> I have to say I'm really uh, delighted to be here among you. I've met some of you earlier in the evening. The energy, the enthusiasm, the activism is just remarkable, although I have to admit that the truth to be told I'm happy to be anywhere where one Williams cannot interrupt me. <laughs> I'll, I'll be sure to tell Juan how that line was received. <laughs> uh, this is a great moment in American politics. Uh, I don't mean today with the government about to shut down in three and a half hours. That may be a great moment, actually. <laughs> isn't, isn't that what you all ran on in November? <laughs> now, don't tweet, Krauthammer advocate shutting the federal government, please. That was just in jest. Uh, but it's a great moment because we are really in the midst of uh, a, a multi-year, a four-year national debate that, in part, is about the size and scope and reach of government. But at a deeper level, it really is about what kind of people we are as Americans, 
what is the uniqueness of the American experiment? And in the largest sense, what is the nature of the social contract between the individual and the state? That is really what we have been talking about for two years. Every debate, every argument, every demonstration is related in some way to that central concern, all the issues that we've debated on health care, on the stimulus, on cap and trade, they're all related to this central issue, the nature of the social contract in this country. And that's what makes it a great moment. I've been involved in this business of politics, watching it, writing about it, for a quarter century. And there's never really been a moment like this, perhaps uh, in 1980, around the time, early years of the Reagan administration, but really nothing since. This is a profound debate about the nature of who we are. It's not a trivial debate. This is not like in the Clinton years where we, we debated the midnight basketball and school uh, uniforms. What we're debating here is who we are as a people. And that's what makes it an exhilarating moment. And this really, you know, this, this two years that we have seen which is now to be followed by two years until the, basically the, the, the climax of this epic, which will be on election day 2012. We're essentially right now in the midpoint, but the first two years uh, that we have just gone through are really very telling, very important, and in the end, despite all the difficulties and the ups and downs, extremely encouraging. I mean, it really is almost cinematic what's happened. Think about this. Two years ago, the Democrats win a smashing victory at the polls. You get a new, young, popular president swept into office with large majorities uh, in the two houses of Congress. They have the wind at their back. And then two years later, there's a historic collapse that even the president has to admit is a shellacking. Uh, and in fact, if you go back, you remember after the 2008 election, uh, the raging Cajun, James Carville, you know, you remember him. <laughs> also known among his friends affectionately as Q-Ball. <laughs> Carville actually wrote a book in which he predicted a 40-year liberal ascendancy. Well, it looked like he was only off by 38. <laughs> And the great part, what I like the most about the story, what gives it its drama, is that you start out with this sort of liberal ascendancy, a lot of energy, enthusiasm, and arrogance behind it. And what ended up bringing it down, at least in the, in, in the first phase, this story is not written yet, we're in the middle of it, but what brings it down uh, initially is it something that was not predictable, not led, not organized, something really spontaneous. And that's what gives this whole two years this sort of epic and theatrical quality. So I think to understand where we're going, you really have to understand what happened in the last two years and how we got to the point where we are now. And I would say that the way to understand the shellacking that the Democrats took in November and to understand the key to what has to be done to give them another one next year is to look at the reasons for this collapse. And to me, there are three reasons. The Democrats mistook their man, they overread their mandate, and they misjudged the mood of the country. The first is the man. And Barack Obama is not to be underestimated. This is a man who came out of nowhere and did what no one else in US history has done. He was essentially a stranger to the American people, and yet with a charisma, an ability to speak, and an appeal to hope and change, he managed to win the presidency. And uh, this is quite remarkable. This is a man who didn't have a paper trail. He had never been known for any signature ideas or signature pieces of legislation, or for his intellectual uh, achievements. The only achievements he'd had, the only thing he'd really done is to write two books. Uh, they were both about himself, incidentally, <laughs> which might have been a clue. <laughs> and one great speech he gave at the 2004 Democratic Convention. 
this is, uh, he was not the youngest of presidents. Kennedy was younger, but Kennedy had served in the Senate two terms in the House, had won the Pulitzer, had been a war hero. He'd had a history, he had a track record. This is a man who came like a meteor out of nowhere, and he won the, the presidency of the, of the most important nation on Earth. And if you go back and remember how mysterious he was, think about the interim period, the transition uh, between his election and his inauguration, those three months, during which I remember at the time being somebody who's paid for my sins to observe him and others <laughs> in Washington. We couldn't quite figure out, and this was really a debate we used to have among ourselves, whether he was a centrist who would occasionally throw a bone to his left, or a leftist who would occasionally throw a bone to his center. Now, if you go back and look at his initial appointments, he gave every indication of being a centrist. Remember, on foreign affairs, he, been, he appointed um, Bob Gates, who'd been the Secretary of Defense in the Bush administration, no left-wing radical. He appointed uh, uh, General Jones, Hillary Clinton, who was, no, uh, uh, who was not known for radicalism in foreign affairs. And on economics, remember, he appointed Paul Volcker, the man who in the early 1980s worked with Ronald Reagan to slay inflation. He appointed Larry Summers, a former Treasury Secretary, sort of center left, but not radical. And Tim Geithner, who'd worked in the Federal Reserve uh, at the head of the New York Fed, hand in glove with the Bush administration in trying to manage the 2008 financial collapse. So these were all very centrist appointments. And I remember still wondering, as the inauguration approached, who is this guy? And I got a chance to try to answer that, that question when a week before the president's swearing in, the president's president-elect staff called a bunch of uh, conservative columnists, about half a dozen of us, and uh, asked us if we wanted to dine with the president-elect, which we did. Now, I have to say that two days before it happened, it leaked in the Huffington Post, which led to rage on the left that the president-elect would do this. So they hurriedly arranged a breakfast with the liberal columnists the morning after. Well, we got steak and they got the bagels, <laughs> which was our first and only victory over the left in those early days. But it was a very interesting evening. Uh, President arrives, we spent three hours with him. Very intelligent man, and again, never to be underestimated. Fluent in every policy issue that we raised. Genial, affable, there, was no, there were no sharp edges. A man clearly who knew how to do politics very well. Uh, as natural a politician as the best I've ever seen, Bill Clinton. Uh, and I remember we asked him tons of questions on policy, and then he leaves after three hours. And I'm sitting around with my colleagues and say, all right, now I'm going to ask you a question I asked before he arrived, which was, is he a centrist who'll throw a bone that was left, or a left who'll throw a bone in the center? Before he arrived, we had no idea. And after he left, I asked it again, and they said, we have no idea. <laughs> and no one knew. That's what's so interesting about him. No one knew. Even in the inaugural address, he never tipped his hand. And then something quite remarkable happened. This is uh, five weeks after he sworn in, February 24th, 2009. He addresses a joint session of Congress, essentially State of the Union, although not officially so. And that night, in that speech, he unveiled the most radical social democratic agenda in this country in the last 70 years. That was a thunderbolt. I remember I was so struck by it, struck by the honesty and the boldness, arrogance, but also this was a courageous guy. He was not mincing words. He was not pretending. He came out, he said, to change America, and he, he detailed in what ways he wanted to. He said he had an agenda to change health care, energy, and education. Now, think about that. Health care is one-sixth of the American economy. Education is the future. Energy is the sinews of the American economy, sort of the essence of any industrial state. You federalize, you nationalize, you take control of that one way or the other, and you have seized what Lenin would call the commanding heights of industrial society. This is not a shy man. Now, you won't remember, because you aren't required to do the 
content analysis than I am, but he used a phrase in that speech, and he kept using it in speeches outlining the vision for the next three months, culminating with a speech in Georgetown on June the 10th. He used the phrase, new foundation, and he used it again and again, hoping it would catch on. It didn't, but it was an attempt with that phrase, capital N, capital F, to put himself in the line of the New Deal, the New Frontier, the Great Society as the author, and the president who would preside over a new era of American liberalism. This was not a modest man. And when you listen to what this agenda was about, and you looked at the breadth and the scope of it, what you began to realize is this is a man who saw America as a country that needed to be changed in the direction of European social democracies. Now, there's nothing wrong with Europe. These are good countries. All of them are our allies, but they're not America. They don't have a Statue of Liberty on their shores. We do. And he had a vision that because of the unfairnesses and the inequalities and the sins of America, it would be redeemed by being more social democratic, more European. Now, I think it's important to stress the phrase social democratic. I think it's a mistake to call Obama a socialist. The reason is that the word socialism is ambiguous. It applies to a lot of things. It includes social democrats like Europeans, but the word socialism also includes the less savory kind of socialism, the authoritarian, the totalitarian, the union of Soviet socialist republics, countries like North Korea and Cuba. He's not a socialist in that sense. He's a social democrat, and I think it's important that that distinction is to be made. But it's an important distinction between what we are and what social democracy is. In America, we value liberty over equality. In Europe, it's the opposite. Here we value enterprise over solidarity. Europe has more protection, more regulation, more taxation, more security, more leveling between the classes. What we have in America is more liberty, more dynamism, more social mobility, more enterprise, and more innovation, and we like it that way. When But you need to understand who Obama is if you want to understand how you, how you uh, approach him and how you approach his agenda and how you try to uh, resist it. I mean, people sometimes wonder what is Barack Obama's in, sort of intrinsic political identity. I'm not talking about birthplace or nationality. That's nonsense. I'm talking about his political identity. Is he what? Is he Hawaiian? Is he Kansas? Is he Indonesian? Is he... Columbia University, is he Ivy League, is he Chicago, is he African American, his political orientation and identity? I would say none of the above. President Obama is a Swede. His vision, his vision of America is to be more like Sweden. Now, he's not just any Swede, he's a highly ambitious, historically self-conscious Swede. When, when he was running for the presidency in 2008, Barack Obama said something very interesting. He said, it was on the eve of the South Carolina primary, that Ronald Reagan was a consequential president in a way that Bill Clinton never was. Now, in part, that was meant to enrage Clinton, and it succeeded in doing that, <laughs> which is why he went kind of nuts on the campaign trail in South Carolina and actually helped Obama win. But that's not, I think, the real reason that Obama said that. He meant it. And what he meant is that Reagan was a man who changed the ideological trajectory of the United States. The way Obama and liberals see American history is like this. There was the glorious 50-year liberal ascendancy beginning in the 30s and ending at the end of the 70s. A liberal ascendancy in which FDR changed the way that we think about government, the proper role of government, the scope of government with the New Deal. And what's interesting is in these ascendancies, you know that your ideology is now dominant when you lose power and the other guys come in, but they retain what you've done. So when Eisenhower came in, there was no repeal of the New Deal. And then you had the second burst of liberalism with Kennedy and Johnson. And then when Nixon and Ford came in, 
there was no repeal of the Great Society. In fact, people don't remember that it was Nixon who started the Environmental Protection Agency, and Nixon who institutionalized affirmative action by giving a lot of uh, enforcement power to the EEOC. Now that's when you know your ideology is dominant, when you lose power and the other guys come in and, and keep its essence. And that's what made Reagan so important. Reagan comes in and he declares that government is not the solution, government is the problem. That was in his inaugural address in 1981. And then what happens? They're in office for 12 years, essentially, the Republicans. Clinton comes in, and what does he say in his 1996 State of the Union address? The era of big government is over. Now, whether he meant it or not, or he governed in that way or not, is not that important. But he was echoing and therefore ratifying as a national consensus and as the new norm the ideology that Reagan had brought in, that we had to get control of government, not let go government control our lives, and reassert that the essence of America was individualism, enterprise, and self-reliance. And that was what Obama was talking about. The 50-year liberal ascendancy ended with Reagan, who did something remarkable, who gave us a 30-year conservative ascendancy. And here comes Obama, and he sees himself in world historical terms as somebody who is going to end that 30-year ascendancy and restore the trajectory that had been interrupted for three decades of ascendant liberalism. That's how he sees himself. This is not a modest man. Now, to be president, you have to have a large self, sense of self. Obama has no lack of that. <laughs> It's quite interesting. If you ask people who've been around Washington forever, who was the psychologically healthiest president you've ever met, they will all give you the same answer, Gerald Ford. Think about it. He's the only one who never ran for the presidency. <laughs> he was the accidental president. That's why he was normal. There's got to be something slightly, I'm speaking here. <laughs> Don't take me too literally here, but there's got to be some screw slightly askew for you to be aspire and also to go through the ordeal of running for the presidency. Ford was a very ordinary, great guy. Everybody loved him. He was a normal guy. And the proof of that is he never even thought about running for the presidency. So, but Obama, I think, sort of improves on the brand when it comes to self-confidence. Um, <laughs> For me, it started with the Berlin speech he gave during the campaign. It's been two years, I still can't figure it out. <laughs> I don't think Germany has any electoral votes when I last checked, <laughs> but there he was with the crowd screaming and cheering. Then there's this other thing he does, which I just find so annoying, I can barely take it. It's very, it's very small, and it's kind of a tick he has, but it causes a tick in me every time I hear it. <laughs> Next time you watch him, and I want you all to suffer with this tick the way I do. <laughs> because after this speech tonight, you won't be able to watch him without hearing this. Every time he'll introduce a high official of his government, he'll say, my Secretary of State, my National Security Team, my Secretary of Agriculture. I mean, other presidents had respect for the colleague and for the country to say, the Secretary of State, not Obama. But I think really the clincher was the speech he gave the night he won the Democratic nomination. It was uh, June 4th, 2008. It was one of these you know, usual Obama rallies with Obama speaking eloquently and uh, co-ed swooning in the aisles, uh, MSNBC anchors feeling thrills up their legs. <laughs> which I can say as a physician is a curable condition. <laughs> uh, and then he said something just amazingly remarkable. He said, history will note this night, meaning the night he won the nomination and began his march to the presidency, uh, as the night on which, among many other great things, the earth began to heal and the oceans began to recede. <laughs> Don't get ahead of me now. <laughs> To which my friend, the economist Irving Stelzer, said, the last person to make the waters recede was Moses. <laughs> and he had help.
Obama works alone. He doesn't need help. <laughs> I do hope you suffer the next time he says my secretary. Because I feel that I'm the only one in America who does, and I need company on this. <laughs> so that's the man. They didn't really know who they were getting, and they got a, a committed social democrat, which is fairly unusual in our tradition. Second thing, they overread their mandate. Yes, Obama won with 53% of the vote. That's a significant win. Uh, the most by anyone since Lyndon Johnson, the most by a Democrat since Lyndon Johnson. Yes, they won the House and the Senate by large majorities. But I think they completely overread what that election was about. Uh, Obama and the Democrats were the beneficiaries of a perfect political storm. You had an intensely you know, unpopular incumbent with sort of war, dragging war, nagging war, wearing war on the country. Uh, we were in the middle of a recession. Uh, Obama was running against a fairly weak opponent. John McCain is a great American. I love the man. He's a great war hero. He's a great American hero, but he wasn't a good candidate. And the other thing is that people don't quite remember is that Towards the end of the campaign, with six weeks to go, we had a financial crisis unprecedented in American political history. We have never had a crisis of this sort, a collapse and truly a panic, six weeks before an election. When you think about the election that brought in FDR, uh, the Wall Street the crash was in 1929, the election was in 32. That's a pretty big gap. Here you had a panic occurring six weeks before the end of, of, uh, of a, a two-term Republican incumbency uh, and when you put all of these conditions together, you have circumstances in which, you know, I think the Italian Communist Party could have won that election. <laughs> Some people will say it actually did. <laughs> but, but not me, of course. I'm fair and balanced. So I, <laughs> I, you, you won't catch me calling them communists. The real mandate that the country gave to the Democrats in 2008, six weeks after the financial panic, in the middle of a recession with an unpopular Republican Party, the real mandate was fix the economy and restore the confidence of Americans in their government and in the economy. Not to restructure the American social contract, but that's what Obama set out to do. And I think that is really important because in America we have two large sort of centrist, consensual parties, one on the left, one on the right. But we do not have the kind of radical, uh, extreme parties that you find in Europe. Europe have real fascist parties, real communist parties. In other words, in Europe, the game is played from goalpost to goalpost. In America, our politics are far generally between the 40-yard lines. And what Obama wanted to do by pushing us towards a European social democracy model was to push us into the red zone. Uh, that's not a pun. I just mean he wanted to go beyond the 40-yard line. <laughs> and in doing that, they misread their mandate. But then they made the worst error of all. They misread the mood of the country. They assumed that they were coming into a situation like 1933. They assumed the country was so shaken by the recession by the financial panic, by the disorientation, demoralization that comes with that, that like in 1933, like in the middle of the Great Depression, the electorate, the citizenry would be supine, afraid, vulnerable, malleable, pliable. They could do what they wanted because the country would be desperate for anything. Now, in the 30s, that was true. They were ready to give FDR leeway, basically experiment in any way he wanted because that was a time when you had 25% unemployment. But, and that's what they thought they were about to come into, and they would be welcomed in this radical social experimentation. The best capturing of this idea was by Rahm Emanuel. You will remember Rahm Emanuel, uh, the former, um, well, now the king of Chicago, but <laughs> formerly the chief of staff to the president, who about, what, six months ago was released into the wild. Uh, <laughs> Rahm. I kind of like that one, too. It's kind of slow. And <laughs> it's, like, it's like it has a long fuse on it, but it's... it's... 
Ram said, you will remember this, a, a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. They thought they could come in on this crisis and use it to do, to change the country. And that's when the story, I think, becomes so wonderful and inspiring and, again, theatrical. So here they are. They misread the man, they overread their mandate, they misread the mood, they think they can change America. And what happens? A spontaneous, unplanned, undirected, pretty anarchic, uh, disorganized, unorganized citizenry says, we don't like this. And that's, it's such an amazing story, and it comes in four parts. It starts in 2009 with the Tea Party demonstrations. This is early in 2009. Uh, and I remember when this were first happening, it was around the time of the stimulus that was sort of the, the um, you know, what launched it. Obama protesting, you know, why are these tea parties out there? That's supposed to be about raising taxes. I haven't raised a single tax. Well, I mean, he was kind of underestimating the intelligence of the electorate. If you're going to expand America to become a European welfare state, you're going to have to ultimately have European levels of taxation. One follows as the other. So they were anticipating what is going to come and what will come, and that's what I think was the beginning of the protest. But then by summer of 08, it became slightly different. It was less sort of undirected, generally against expansion of government uh, and about inevitable taxes. It became in the summer of 09, that was the summer of Obamacare. That was the summer of discontent over the legislation that the Democrats assumed they would get through but by June, then by July. Uh, and they thought they would be able to ram it through very quickly. That's when you got the town halls, the loud protests, and this kind of the focusing on a major issue, and an issue that became a symbolism, a symbol for the larger idea of the government overreaching and becoming too overbearing. Then you come into the winter of 2009, 2010, when this movement, which is up until now sort of restricted to activists, people who come out to the town halls, you know, on cold days, it's not everybody, but that's when you get them off-year elections, November 2009 and then January 2010 in Massachusetts. In November 2009, it was the governorship in New Jersey and, and Virginia, and then, of course, the famous election January 2010 uh, in, in Massachusetts in the Senate race. Now, here's where the protests became more general, because whereas it's the activists who come out to the town halls, this is where ordinary people who aren't that energetic or activists will express themselves at the ballot box. And did they ever? That was a shocking election. It was shocking in the gubernatorial elections because Obama won in 2008 by carrying independence. Well, independence in Virginia and New Jersey broke two to one against the Democrats. And in Massachusetts, the bluest of the blue, it broke three to one against the Democrats. That was a very strong message. The Tea Party was the tip of the iceberg, or if you will, the tip of the spear, although I think after Tucson, we're not allowed to use metaphors. <laughs> so I'll go back to the tip of the iceberg, even though it sunk the Titanic, so maybe that's an instrument of aggression as well. I don't know. It gets, <laughs> it gets real complicated here, the rules that the media establishes when they like. Um, so now you've got this message. And here's what's quite amazing. So the message is sent in these off-year elections. Some of the people in the Obama administration here, in fact, Rahm, uh, not yet released into the wild, <laughs> Rahm advised the president to cut down Obamacare, to kind of make it, to go to the Republicans, to get something a lot smaller, a lot more across the aisle, and he was rejected. They went for the gold, and they got it. They decided to go all out to it. Now remember, when Scott Brown ran in Massachusetts, he didn't run as a generic Republican. He ran as a guy who had, who had a platform, and he said openly and, and absolutely honestly, you elect me, I will stop Obamacare, I'll be the 41st vote. That was, so it was not as if it was hidden in his hidden agenda. That's what, it was essentially a referendum on that in Massachusetts. So having heard the voice of Massachusetts of all places, a man who took a seat that had been held by the Kennedys since 1953 uh, to ignore the message from Massachusetts to say nothing of Virginia and New Jersey was a big deal. They decided they were going to go for it. Obama wanted to make his mark, and he certainly did. Now, they had to use 
uh, pretty sort of um, unusual uh, parliamentary maneuver to do it, reconciliation, which was ne never intended for anything of this sort. And they also did something also unprecedented. Never in American history has anything on the scope of Obamacare been passed in the Congress of the United States uh, completely on party line votes, never. Not Social Security, not Medicare, not Medicaid, not the Civil Rights Act. Nothing of this size and scope ever. They decided to do it without a single Republican, without any input and against the sort of expressed will of people in three states who voted in off-year elections. So that added insult to injury. The injury was that he wanted to change America in a direction people don't want to go. The insult was that after they had been told it's not where we want to go, they ignored it and went ahead anyway. And that's why you got stage four, the fourth act of this great drama of resistance, which was the elections of November 2010. The American people said, stop. The best description of the election last year was to say, was somebody who said that this wasn't an election, it was a restraining order. <laughs> Think of the scope of this shellacking, to quote our president. It wasn't just that the Republicans won 63 seats in the House, which was the most by anybody, any party in 70 years, or that they won six seats in the Senate. It, it would have been nine, but there were a few errors in nominating candidates, which I will not get into because the mail I get about <laughs> Christine O'Donnell continues to this day, and I'm sure it may divide the room. So. I want to be on your friendly side. I won't go into that. Um, 60, but the most important one, the one that was sort of overlooked on election day but really had the most profound effect, was the fact that Republicans gained about 680 seats in the state houses, as you well know, here in this state. <laughs> I mean, this really is the grassroots, the real America. This, is, this isn't AstroTurf. I love the way the Democrats cannot fathom a natural, pure, completely uh, authentic American resistance to their loony ideas. They have to imagine that it's AstroTurf and it's the Koch brothers who created it out of thin air. <laughs> But that's an aside. Let me go back to where I was, which was 680 state, um, state legislators uh, flipping. 19 of the 99 state houses flipped. Now, you ask yourself, why only 99, right? There's one state that's unicameral. And the reason I go off on this tangent is I love the word unicameral. I just, <laughs> I just can't help it. I just always want to include it. It's Nebraska, but use it as a bar bet. Next week, somebody says, do all states have two houses and you'll win a couple of beers? <laughs> 19 state houses flip. And everybody said, well, that's interesting. Well, look what happened. Look at what happened in Wisconsin. Look what's happening in Ohio. Let's look what's happening across the country. The beauty of that is that the revolt is now occurring on three levels. The grassroots, people in the voting booth, at the federal level, where the Republicans now control one house, and now when no, when no one expected the state level. And it's all about the same thing. That's what gives it its drama. It's all about the central issue, the size, the scope, the reach of government. It's all about American exceptionalism, <clears throat> excuse me, whether we want to be like Europe, whether we, we're, we're unique. It's all about the nature of the social contract happening now everywhere. Think of this week alone. This week alone, we just heard yesterday of the miraculous 7,000 votes. Um, it's amazing how the Lord provides, you know? In the 40 years in the desert, people said, Moses, what are we going to eat? And they wake up in the morning, and there's manna on the ground. Well, that just happened in Wisconsin, the man. <laughs> so that's a pretty big deal, Wisconsin. And remember, Wisconsin is sort of the heart of progressivism, historically, of all places. Uh, look what's happening in Ohio. Look what's happening across the country. 
That's what happened this week here. Look what happened this week as well. At the federal level, Paul Ryan, the head of the Budget Committee, House Budget Committee. <laughs> produced the most amazing document. I mean, this really is the boldest, most courageous, uh, most reckless, if you like, um, rethinking of the American welfare state in our lifetime. In my column that appeared this morning, I, I, I remember the, someone once said in 1983, British Labor Party issued a very radical left-wing 700-page manifesto that one liberal uh, Labor Party official dubbed the longest suicide note in history. <laughs> so I, with all due respect, I said of the 72-page 10-year budget brought by Paul Ryan that it could be the most, at 37 footnotes, the most annotated suicide note in history. <laughs> but it is an amazing document. It's very risky what he did. I mean, what has we have just seen in this country, and that's what's so remarkable, again, it's all about this debate. This would never have happened if we hadn't that, the, the two years of the liberal rise and the collapse and the shellacking and the sweeping of the house and the sweeping of the state house and, and what's happening in Wisconsin. The country wouldn't have been ready. Now it's ready to hear. It's ready to hear a, a plan that talks about tax reform, individual and corporate, that talks about entitlement reform in a serious way, in a way that nobody would dare have done. Medicare and Medicaid, which wants to apply the lessons of the 1986 tax reform to the current situation, which wants to apply the lessons of the 1996 welfare reform, one of the great triumphs of our time in social policy, signed by President Clinton, working with Newt Gingrich and the rest of the Republicans in the House, wants to recapitulate the success they had with cash welfare, with other kinds of welfare, meaning food stamps, housing, etc. This is a plan of tremendous breadth and scope. This is a plan that really reimagines the welfare state in a way that nobody would dare to. And that's what makes this a great moment. You've got this happening at the state level, where you get governors in what were traditionally thought of in Wisconsin, for example, as liberal states daring to take on the corrupt symbiosis between the government unions and the politicians, where one side funds the politicians endlessly. The politicians negotiate contracts that creates the slush funds and, and the cash and collects the dues on behalf of the unions, which get recycled into the Democratic politicians' war chest. I mean, the most important element of the Wisconsin reform is not uh, the, the, the curtailing of, uh, of the, the bargaining power of the unions. That's not what it was about. The most important element, and the unions wouldn't admit this, was that up until now, the state of Wisconsin collects union dues. And when the state collects it, you've got to fork it over or you go to jail. So that's you, you, you using the coercive power of the state to keep the coffers of the unions going. In Indiana, where Mitch Daniels abolished that on the day he came into office, uh, I think participation in unions, or at least the giving of union dues, has declined in his state among state workers by 93%. The reason, the reason the union, so that's the lengths to which they go. They know that so much is at stake here. It's at stake at the state level, and it's now at stake at the federal level. And here's where it gets really interesting, Obama's response to all this. So we have this two-year epic. He's on top. He rams through Obamacare. He gets a trillion-dollar stimulus. He fails on cap-and-trade. But he's achieved something. And I would, again, you don't underestimate this man. If his presidency were to end today and Obamacare were to be institutionalized, he would be remembered as a historic president. Not quite at the level of Reagan, but historic president because Obamacare, control of one-sixth of the economy, will change our country forever and there won't be any going back. And I predict that if it's not repealed, within 10 years we will go to a single-payer system like in Britain or in Canada, because there'll be no other way to go. The government will be so deeply entrenched in running health care, but it will be so crazily inefficient uh, that people will say, well, what the hell, let's cut out the middleman, we'll, we'll go for the real thing. 
And remember, Obama himself has admitted that he wanted nationalized health care, as in Britain or Canada, and he chose to go this route not because he changed his mind about how preferable a single-payer system is, but because he thought in America the kind of people would not be willing to accept going at it in one big step. And I think that's why it's now stepwise. I mean, the, the left of the Democratic Party understands nothing. They made all this noise for months and months and, 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 and threatened to vote against Obamacare because there was no public option. That was so absurd. I knew in the end they would not vote against Obamacare because there was no public option. You don't need a public option. Obamacare provides one. It's called the insurance companies. The insurance companies are turned into a utility by Obamacare. They no longer assess risk on their own the way a real insurer does. That's what insurance is about. All the mandates and dictates are from the federal government. It acts like the power company. It can raise rates only if it's allowed to. It has to go to the government. So this is an intermediate step on the way to national health care. Obama knows that, and Obama knows that he needs re-election to ensure that Obamacare stays in place. And if it stays in place in and of itself, it will make his presidency historic because it will take us in a direction that will be irreversible. When you nationalize a sixth of the economy, you've done a lot. And also, what Obamacare does and what national health care does, and you see it in Canada and Britain and European countries as well, is basically it's the final brick. It's the final element of this sort of hyper-entitlement state. And when you create that, you create this expectation, this sense of entitlement, this sense of sort of being infantilized by the government. And it's very obvious what that results in. We see it. It's not a theoretical proposition what it causes. You see it on the streets in Greece. You see it on the streets in Britain. You see it on the streets in France. People become so accustomed to being provided by the government of everything that when even a bit of it is taken away, they go crazy. They riot in the streets. In France, the students rioted because of a, a legislation that was raising the retirement age from 60 to 62. And these are people who are 18, and they're breaking <laughs> windows. That tells you how you've changed the nature of the electorate. You've changed the psychology. You've changed the expectations. You've changed the zeitgeist. And that's what's so pernicious about all of this. It isn't only that it bankrupts the country. It isn't only that it changes the nature of the social contract. But it does it in a way that becomes fairly irreversible, because once you change the consciousness of the people, the sense of their independence and self-reliance, then you've ensured that this will remain there forever. Now, the only correction is the real world. And that's what Europe is experiencing today, the real world. In the end, it's not sustainable. In the end, it has to be changed. In the end, they're going to have to go into austerity. They're going to have to rethink the entire entitlement state. It cannot stand. The, this week, Portugal went under, the third EU country. Spain is next. All the others are next, and they know it. The beauty of this moment in our history is that we can see this happening in front of our eyes. We have been given another gift, another piece of manna. Up until now, the arguments about the welfare state, the hyper-entitlement state, expansion, trying to be more like European social democracies was a theoretical one. Is it sustainable? Is it not? Conservatives would argue no. Liberals would argue yes. Well, we don't have to argue anymore. The empirical evidence is out there. It's called Europe. It's the riots in Greece. It's the demonstrations we just saw, the riots that we saw in Britain. I mean, in Greece, I, I love how this works. They have a retirement age. I think it's 55, but it's 10 years earlier if you're in the dangerous professions, which include, I looked at this list, Radio announcer, you should think about it. <laughs> I asked about this. It's not because people will pick at your house. It's the germs, supposedly, you're exposed to on the microphone. This is Greece. But the, my favorite in that category was hairdresser. And I realized that I missed my calling. I should have been. I should have been a Greek hairdresser. I wouldn't have to be here tonight. I'd be on a beach in the Adriatic collecting my pension right now. <laughs> this is unsustainable social constructions, and we see it happening now. That's what I think, in part, gave the Republicans the courage. And this required courage by the leadership of the House 
to let Ryan go ahead with this could be suicidal, but incredibly courageous, forward-looking plan to restructure, rethink, remake the American uh, welfare state before it goes over the European cliff. And we do have a few years. But for the next two years, nothing is going to happen on the ground. In other words, in the next two years, there's not going to be an advance of Obamaism because Republicans control the House and because the country will not allow it. There's not going to be cap and trade. There's not going to be an ex expansion of, uh, of health care or changes of that sort. There's not going to be a new stimulus. We are not going to have these radical reforms. And on the other hand, Republicans, conservatives, when you control only one house, you cannot create positive legislative outcomes. That's a lesson I think, I hope Republicans in the House will keep in mind in the shutdown days. Uh, you got to remember, it's a democracy. Yes, they won a smashing victory in November. Yes, the country spoke very loudly. But under our bicameral structure, I love that word, <laughs> you need two houses and the presidency. You can't do it otherwise. Say what you have to say. Get as much as you can. Take your winnings and go on to the next battle. Because the real battle is not over $30 billion in the 2010 budget. The real battle is November 2012. That will be a historic day in America. That's where the two choices, the two paths will appear, and America will go left or right. There's no other way. If Obama is reelected, we will have Obamacare and the country will be changed. If Obama is reelected and the Republicans push too hard and alienate the country, if he succeeds in painting the conservatives and the Republicans as extreme, he may even win back one or two houses. And then he controls the agenda. And then he completes the work. Then he gets his cap and trade and control over energy. Then he gets another stimulus. And then we become unrecognizable as a country. That's what's at stake in November 2012. And that's why everything he does is to win in 2012. All the centrist maneuvers he's made, and these are bones he's throwing to the Senate. Every single one is not a sincere relocation of his political ideology in the center. He is not a centrist. He's not even a Clinton. He's not center left. He's not the DLC, which doesn't even exist anymore, the centrist think tank of the Democrats. He's a man of the left. That's who he is. That's where he wants to make his mark. But he knows he has to win to do it. He can't complete the mission in this uh, term. The verdict was rendered in November 2010. He's got to win back the mandate. And that's why Republicans have to keep in mind that the, the game is all about 2010, 2012. That's when the future of the country is decided. And that's why you can't expect, even though people have made their pledges, they pledge to try to do what they can. When you control one house, you can't unilaterally pass legislation. You make your case. You take your gains. You maneuver. You prepare. You argue. You use the Rhine blueprint. You tell America you have two choices. One leads to Greece and Ireland and Portugal. And the other is a restoration of America. That's the choice. And that's why I think this is a great moment. I think that what Obama is going to do between now and then is to continue with all the centrist gestures. You know, the appointment of William Daly to be his chief of staff. The bromance he's having with Jeffrey Immelt, the head of GE. <laughs> whom he appointed to a special committee on enterprise and the, the reconciliation he's having with uh, the Chamber of Commerce as a way to make a gesture that he's not anti-business, even a, a measure here and there to try to revive some of the trade uh, treaties that he and his colleagues have killed. All of this is to maneuver and to appear to be more centrist. It's also to try to demonize the Republicans especially now that the Ryan plan has been unveiled as extreme. A responsible president, a one who really wanted to change and save the welfare state, something like it is today and something in the vision of, that is traditionally American, would make a counterproposal to what Republicans are offering and try to find a deal between now and 2012. My prediction is that Obama will do nothing of the sort. If you heard or watched the demagoguery coming out of the, the Democrats in the last three days since the Ryan plan was released, you know what's coming. 
Nancy Pelosi didn't just accuse Ryan of uh, wanting to throw old people in the snow. He says they want to kill old people. This is a pretty high escalation of the rhetoric. Uh, it doesn't satisfy the atavistic instincts of Republicans and conservatives to throw old ladies in the snow. They've got to stomp on them while they're in the snow. <laughs> That's what you're going to be hearing between. It's going to be all about they're going to steal your Medicare, they're going to steal your Medicaid and Social Security. That's what I think is going to happen. We're going to have a great debate. And it's going to be very incumbent on conservatives and Republicans to make the case, to try to make the difficult arguments for how we have to reform the welfare state and to do it for two reasons. And here's where I'm going to conclude. One reason is the easy one to make, the, the case that anybody can make in his sleep. And that is, it's unsustainable. Don't ask me. Don't look at the theory. Look at Europe. It's not sustainable. Look at the graphs, the charts from the CBO, the nonpartisan CBO. They all take us over a cliff in five or 10 years. Debt that's over 100% of GDP, not sustainable, will cause hyperinflation and the collapse of the American economy and of our power in the world. That's one road. You can see it. It's right out there. The more difficult argument to make, but I think the more fundamental one, apart from being unsustainable, it's in many ways un-American. It's not who we are. We are a country that is a city on a hill, and it is that way. The reason people come to our shores from all over the world the way they don't go to other shores is because we stand for liberty. This is where they come to breathe free. And to breathe free, you need a government that knows its limits. You need a government constrained by the original vision of the founders as a government of enumerated powers, one where you can't just slap an individual mandate on the individual and threaten him with a fine if he won't enter into a private contract with a private insurance company. We don't do that, not because it's unsustainable, even though it is, but also because it's not how government ought to react or to interact with its citizenry. We believe that the social contract here is a different one. The government is the one that is restrained. It's not as if the government has control of everything and will allow you these islands of liberty. This is a country where your liberty is paramount. And the government is allowed very circumscribed Madisonian areas where it's allowed to, to tell you what to do. That difference between the foreground and the background, between who has the circumscribed uh, freedom of action, the citizen or the government, is the heart of the argument. And that's the one that we have to make. That's the one that we can make. And if we make it well, we'll win next November. Thank you very much. Folks, Dr. Krauthammer has graciously agreed to do a few Q&As. So if you have a question, we'd like for you to come up front. We respectfully ask that it's exactly that a question. Please do not make statements. And uh, so we're going to take a, a few of them if you'll come up to the front of the stage. Could I have your name, sir? Jeff Weingarten. Uh, Dr. Krauthammer, uh, in your very professional opinion, is President Obama the puppet or the puppeteer? Well, I like unloaded questions. <laughs> I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I don't care about the birth certificate. I don't care where he was born. I don't believe anybody is manipulating him. I don't believe he's a Manchurian candidate. I take him for the man I met at that dinner and the man I saw and I believe he is. He's a sincere social democrat. He's not anti-American. He, he has a different understanding, division of America. It's not mine. He doesn't hate his country. He sees it differently. He sees it as very sinned and flawed and he sees himself as the redeemer. I grant him that. I grant him also honesty in unveiling his program and pursuing it. I disagree, as you know, if you ever tune into Fox News, with him on occasion, like every night. <laughs> but I think it is a terrible mistake 
to go into puppeteers and puppetry and manipulation. This is an argument. I think this is a great day for America. I think Obama brought the country a great debate. If we had had a moderate centrist Democrat, we wouldn't be where we are. He threw down a challenge to America. I want to take you in a direction that I think is one that is more fair, where the differences among citizens are leveled, there's more equality, it's like Europe. I'll take you there. And America stood up and said, we don't want to go, and we will have the verdict next year. So I take him as who he is, and I think we ought to have honest debates, accept the good faith of the other side, try not to argue like they do all the time about conspiracies, motives, astroturf, and all this stuff. We're Americans. We can have a grown-up debate. And if we do, our side will win it. Your name and your question. Uh, Samuel Settle. And what do you think about the Republican Study Committee's alternative to Ryan's budget? Does it split the message or? Um... See, I always like a wonky question that nobody in the room has heard of, and I barely have. Now, on television, I would fake it, you know. I would never admit that I'm not exactly sure what their program is. But it's the Mike Pence program, right? This is the, it's, it's more radical. Uh, I think if you look at the response to the Ryan program itself, which is at a blue of Vesuvius among the, Repub among the Democrats, uh, I, I think that's about as far as you want to go. If you're not the party in power, if you had control of the House, the Senate, and the, and the presidency, then I think you could go to the country with anything you wanted and propose it and try to enact it. I think when you're in opposition and you've got a long way to go, remember, only twice since 19, 1933 has an incumbent president been defeated in re-election. This is not easy to do. The economy will probably be healthier by November of 2012. If the slope continues on unemployment, he'll be in fairly good shape. This is no slam dunk. This is going to be a very difficult election. Again, I don't see that this is a time for going to the most ideological extreme or the purest. You can't afford it. There's too much at stake. That's why I must say, if I go back to the arguments I had with some people over uh, the more pure conservative nominees in some states, like, I hate to say it again, but Delaware, you know, Mike Castle, who is no conservative, he's a rhino, but he's a Republican. And on two of the three big issues, stimulus, health care, and cap and trade, he got two out of three right. We now have a Democrat in that seat who's going to get all of them wrong. And if you believe, as I do, that the big issue is election 2012, the big, the, the future of the country will be decided by whether Obama and this kind of social democratic ideology gets a second term to complete its agenda or not. Then you have to think tactically as well as strategically and propose what you can, what you think Americans will accept before you go all the way out to the, to the, uh, to the extreme. So I think tactics here are very important and we, we, we should not lose track of that. If you only keep track of purity at a time when you are the minority uh, among the governing institutions, you're going to lose. And your name and your question. Yes, Beth Hegedus. Dr. Krauthammer, Jim Messina is the new wonder kind for the Obama campaign. He, from what I've been reading, he is immersing himself in everything Republican, everything conservative, and everything independent. Who do we, as Republicans and conservatives, have on our side that has that kind of forward-thinking, campaign, political, strategic mind? Well, we are uh, lucky to have people like um, Nick Gillespie and Karl Rove, who did a very good job in looking at the electoral map 2010, raising money, strategically helping candidates which I think was extremely effective. In fact, it was so effective that that's why you have the Democrats now racing to catch up with that by getting their own counterparts to that. Now, Obama as an incumbent president has huge advantages in raising money, but I would not underestimate how the Republicans, how well the Republicans will do. There are a lot of people out there who understand what's going on, who know how these 
things are done, and I think I wouldn't be, be too afraid of that element of that. What I think is most important of all is to get the message right, to know how to explain it, and to get the right messenger. Sir, your name and your question. Uh, Nick Sabatine, and I guess my question follows your last comment. Uh, I'll date myself the $64,000 question. Who do you think as a political commentator and psychologist has the ability to win on the conservative side in 2012? Well, let me say in answer to some of you I talked to before uh, tonight's presentation that if nominated, I will not run. <laughs> But, but if elected, I'll serve. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm, just, I'm just naturally lazy. If you'll give it to me, if you'll, gi you'll give it to me with that large airplane, I'll take it. Well, you'll notice I didn't uh, um, mention a single proper name in my entire address among Republicans. Um, let me just say something in general, because it would take me too long to go through the list. I think what the Republicans need is someone who can make the case who has the least uh, political baggage in their past. The reason is this. If I do believe the lesson of 2010 is if you make this an ideological election, an election over, again, the central issue, the size, the scope, the reach of government, the nature of the social contract. You make it like that, we crush the other side. We speak for the tradition of America. People feel it in their bones. We don't want to be a Greece. We want to be America. But that was a midterm election, so there was nobody at the head of the ticket. How do you make the 2012 election most like the midterm election? Because if we have somebody who becomes a lightning rod in their personality, then you skew the election and we lose the advantage of having the ideological argument on our side. So just thinking of this sort of theoretically, what you want is somebody who will make this a referendum on Obama and Obamaism. So who do you choose? I think what you choose, generically speaking, is somebody who is extremely dull. That's what I want. I want a candidate who is dull as mud. My pol somebody who will not attract attention to himself, but who will make the argument. How dull? My childhood hero in politics was Senator Scoop Jackson of Washington State. You're laughing because you know the story. It was said of Scoop Jackson that if he ever gave a fireside chat, the fire would go out. <laughs> I want a candidate who'll make the fire go out. I don't want charisma. We tried it in 2008. The country's not that happy with the result. I don't want um, people with very complicated histories, either personal or political. I personally don't care about the personal history of a candidate, but the electorate does. That's just a fact. I want somebody who will simply make the case without being a lightning rod, for example, a Mitch Daniels who's made the case by what he's done in Indiana, uh, or somebody with the least amount of negatives. I mean, I'm not a Palenti advocate, but I think if the field ends up to be as weak as I think it is, we may end up with a Palenti as the last man standing because he's got all the right ideas and views. He's not that well known. He's a fairly successful two-term governor. I think we may end up with him, and if we do, I hope he can make the case. I'm a little bit worried about the ones who are more out there. I'll give you one example, Mitch Rom uh, Mitt Romney. I like the man, I admire the man. I'll, if he's a nominee, I will enthusiastically support the man. I think he has the right character and the right ideas. But he's got one millstone, a liability he cannot get around. That is what happened in Massachusetts. Now, the problem is that whenever he talks about Obamacare, and Obamacare is the heart of the argument because it is the symbol of Obamaism and government overreach. So if you're going to make the central issue of the campaign Obamacare, which you have to, and you have as a nominee of Mitt Romney, what does he have to do? He has to spend the first half hour explaining away what happened in Massachusetts. It's hard to do. I don't fault him for that. He's a governor of a liberal state. He tried something. I remember when he explained it to me long ago. 
it made a lot of sense in a lot of ways. It didn't succeed. Unfortunately, he stuck with it. So what I'm saying is pick a candidate who's not going to have to explain himself away for the first 30 minutes of any introduction, whether it's personal history or political history. Now, I'm not endorsing uh, these nominees, but I want somebody who will make the case. I believe in the case, and that's why I want to see an election that is as purely ideological as we can make it. Your name and your question. David Cohen, uh, I, can I assume then from, from your last answer that someone like a Paul Ryan, even if he was maybe drafted, wouldn't, wouldn't suit? No, I, I think a Ryan would suit. I think a Ryan would be an excellent nominee. The problem with Ryan is I don't think he'll do it because he really believes in what he's now proposed. He's the head of the budget committee. He's made the most interesting, important sort of a manifesto for a conservative side in decades, at least since Reagan, and he wants to defend it in his arena, in the House. Now, I would draft him. I think he'd be, look, here's how I see it. I think we have a fairly weak established field, but Republicans have a very strong bench. We've got Chris, Christie on the bench, meaning that for the future, for 2016. <laughs> we've, got, we've got a Marco Rubio. We've got a, a Paul Ryan. Uh, um, I'm not taking nominations. <laughs> We're running out of time. <laughs> Write them down, email them to me tonight. I'll include it in my next speech. <laughs> and, and you know, Nikki Haley, I could, there are a lot of young to track. We have a very strong future. The problem is it's arriving a little too late for 2012. Uh, Christie could run. I'd love to see him run. He's blunt spoken. Uh, he takes people on. I think he's got the right ideas. He's a bull in a china shop. Uh, he's a man with a large personality in every way. I, I really like him. I think he'd be great. But there's something presumptuous about running for the presidency when you've only been in office as a governor for one term, for, for a year. He said that. He knows that. The only person who's ever defied that we know who it is. But, uh, <laughs> you guys are great. I don't even have to finish my punch. <laughs> Just get halfway there, and you do the heavy lifting for me. So, the, and he said, you know, what do I have to do short of suicide to convince you I'm not running? I would say, Governor, do it. I'll run you posthumously. <laughs> um, Paul Ryan would be a great candidate, but I think he sort of has this He's not new. He's been around forever. I mean, he's, I think he's in his seventh or tenth term. He's been, he's a serious guy who's been in politics and understands it very well. But he's new on the national scene, and it may be a risk. Now, I would not be averse if you could talk him out of continuing what he's doing now. Uh, have a, you know, a Christie, Ryan, uh, how do you want to mix this uh, ticket up for 2012? I would go for it. I think you might have to reach, take a bit of a risk on unknowns or unknown on the national scene. Uh, to win in 2012. Again, you're running against an incumbent and the economy will likely be better. Um, so I wouldn't be against it. I, but as an analytic point, as one just looking at it from the outside, seeing what's most likely, they would be getting in pretty late and would be pretty hard to do. The more established candidates, the ones who already will be in the race this spring and who will be in the debates this summer, will have a decided advantage, so it may not be doable. But I would not be averse to that, and I would welcome it, actually. Okay, fine. final two questions. Your name, sir? My name is Don Muller. And Dr. Krauthammer, I'd like to know what your thoughts are on Hillary Clinton challenging Obama. Uh, I don't think it's going to happen. I think she, she had her moment, she had her chance, and she ran a tough campaign. She lost. I don't think there's a second act for the Clintons. Um, <laughs> I was, I was curious what reaction it would get. It was just a single clapping. I was, I, that, that tells me a lot. Um, no, I, I, I really think she is, I mean, it would be crazy. It would be, it would really would be political suicide. Uh, but there are a lot of ways in, it, in which it would be suicide. But think of, and how it would be smirched, the reputation the Clintons have among liberals and Democrats. I mean, he's, He's a hero. She's done, in their eyes, not in mine, but in their eyes, 
reasonably good job as sec Secretary of State, they'd be going out on a real up note and be remembered historically with affection, like uh, the Roosevelts and others. That, and why would you jeopardize that? But think of it in this way. The Democratic Party, which is so dependent on African Americans and has been the recipient of unwavering loyalty from African Americans for 50 years, actually longer, going back to FDR, uh, I vote 90% Democratic, whether the nominee is white or black. They now, the Democrats then become the party to elect the first president, black president, and then they're gonna be Democrats who are gonna try to deny the first black president a second term? No, that's not in the cards, it's not gonna happen. And that's why, that explains why Obama is acting the way he is. That's why he can be as centrist as he wants. He can diss his left as much as he wants. They're not gonna, they have nowhere to go. He will play the censors from now till election day because he has no threat from the left. Unlike a lot of other Democrats, Carter, uh, he was destroyed by a threat from the left, among other reasons he was destroyed, but that was one of them. Uh, you know, Lyndon Johnson, I mean, there, there's a long history of this. It is not gonna happen, and that's why Obama has a completely free hand to play the centrist for two years and he's a good uh, chameleon. He could pull it off. It'll be decided by independents. If they believe he's a centrist, uh, he'd have a very good chance of winning. If they don't, if they're in the mood they were on November 2010, then he'll lose. We'll do one more, or? Yes, sir, one sure, more. Let's go. My name is Victor Sleish. Um In 2008, we saw the youth vote play a massive role in the presidential uh, elections. Um, do you think Obama will be able to get uh, that support from the young people again in 2012? And if they do, how do we get them out of that sand trap? How do we get the young out of the sand trap or get us conservatives out of the sand trap? <laughs> Both. Uh, yeah. Both. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I once wrote a, a column opposing high voter turnout. <laughs> I think I'm prouder of that than almost anything I've ever written. <laughs> you have no idea the mail I got from the do-gooders. I've always thought that it's a sign of societal health how low the turnout is in a country for the following reason. When you live in a country where the government really determines your life, a repressive government, dictatorial government, or one that is really so entrenched in your life it tells you what to do, you would vote if you had a free vote. You would vote because it's so important to you. And that's why there's much higher turnout in countries where the government controls 51% of GDP as it does in Europe than it does here where it's a much lower percentage. If government is incidental to your life, it affects your life in some ways, but it's not the end all and, and be all. Your welfare, your future, your employment, your prosperity, your, your spirit, is not determined by what the government does, then you'll have less incentive to go to the polls, and that's a healthy thing. It's a, it's a reflection that you have limited government with limited influence, limited powers. I've always been, found it amusing that the worst dictatorships have the biggest, have the highest uh, turnout. Syria, last time around, had a 99.9% .9 turnout. And I remember once reading in Albania, which, when it was still a communist country, they, they read, they actually published the final vote in a presidential election for Anwar Hoxhar, the late and unlamented Anwar Hoxhar. And the vote was, it was something like 5,426,171 to two. <laughs> and I wrote a column saying, who are these two? <laughs> what prison are they in? <laughs> And can we talk to them? <laughs> so uh, I, this is an aside. I'm glad I could do this, because I have never sort of said this in a talk before. But it's one of my pet th theories about low voter turnout. So everybody's enthusiastic when there's high turnout. I'm not against it, basically. If people want to turn out, it's a good thing. But I do think that maybe we ought to reconsider the voting age. And maybe it's because I'm getting to be an old fogey. <laughs> 
the only argument, and the one I respect, the reason I wouldn't change it is because if you're old enough to fight, you're old enough to vote. That isn't, you know, that, that, that clinches it for me. But, you know, Madison, Wisconsin is not a, um, uh, is not a metropolis with a lot of soldiers in it, the last time I checked. Um, there is something to be said for um, the consideration that you get from living life and from learning. I mean, the classic line is from Winston Churchill, if, if you're not a socialist when you're 30, you don't have a heart. And if you're not a conservative when you're 60, you don't have a head. That's one of the famous ones. There's also a, be a better one that I have to share with you because I've got a long drive ahead, and I, this is one I really enjoy. Churchill once went down to the men's room in the House of Commons where Clement Attlee was at one of the urinals, and Churchill went over eight urinals over. Attlee was the leader of the Labor Party, fairly radical Labor Party at the time. Attlee says, Winston, a bit standoffish today, aren't you? And Winston said, that's because, my dear Clement, every time you see something large, you want to nationalize it. <laughs> Ladies and, Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Charles Krauthammer. What an evening. What an evening. I'd now like to call the Honorable Colin Hannes to the stage uh, from Let Freedom Ring. Thanks, RJ. <clears throat> That was simply sparkling, brilliant, erudite analysis. Not just psychological analysis or political analysis, but cultural and, and social analysis. I think it was the last Churchill joke that did <laughs> <laughs> You know, erudition is rare, but erudition that rises to the level of common sense thank is you. the rarest of all. So we thank you for that. Speaking of which, um, I'm holding in my hands here two awards, both of which you won this year. They are called the Wyrick Award. The Wyrick Awards dinner is held the night before CPAC starts, and it is named in honor of Paul Wyrick, who was a great friend of this conference and who held a lunch on Capitol Hill for conservative leaders and particularly members of Congress every Wednesday that Congress was in session. After Paul died, I became the co-chair of it along with Morton Blackwell. It continues. I encourage any of you who are interested in coming to one. Uh, it is by invitation only, but it takes place every Wednesday that both houses of Congress are in session. John Gizzi is a regular. Uh, Loman Henry and Fred Anton are regular uh, visitors. And once a year, we have the Wyrick Awards Dinner. Paul Weyrich was the founder and first president of the Heritage Foundation. He was the founder of and longtime president of Free Congress Foundation. He was one of the founders of the American Legislative Exchange Council. He is the person to whom it is credited that he came up with the term moral majority for, for Jerry Falwell, one of the truly great conservative leaders of our time. So we have a series of awards which we initially uh, give as finalists three in each category, and the media person of the year finalist for this year was Charles Krauthammer, and then at the dinner, we announced the winner, of which there's only one, and you were the winner as well. So it is with great pleasure that I present both awards to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Both sides. That's tremendous.